Well, good morning and uh, good afternoon to those watching uh, online and welcome. Uh, welcome to this event entitled Libya General Elections 2021, a discussion series with Libyan leaders. This event is in both English and Arabic on the event page. Uh, please choose the player which works best for you. Uh, and this is being live streamed and recorded. I am Michael Yaffe. I'm the Vice President for the Middle East North Africa Center here at the United States Institute of Peace. And for those of you who have been here to USIP before, welcome back. And for those of you who are new to USIP, welcome. And permit me to say just a few brief words about the Institute. USIP was created by an act of Congress in 1984 to serve as an independent, nonpartisan institution dedicated to peace building, particularly with the prevention, the mitigation, and resolution of violent conflict. We conduct research, convening, and work in conflict zones around the world with a field presence of 16, in 16 countries. And USIP has been working in Libya since 2012 where we conduct research for informing policymakers and practitioners about conflict-related issues and help build a local peace infrastructure by strengthening the capacity of key stakeholders like women and youth and institutions like the Ministry of Justice. USIP recently began a project with funding from the US State Department to increase election security by working with the Ministry of Interior to strengthen the police's ability to partner and problem solve with local communities. In light of the upcoming election, set to begin next month, today's event is a timely conversation with Fidel Lamin, founder and lead member of the Afa Awatan political party. This event is the second in a series of moderated discussions USIP is hosting to provide a neutral platform for Libyans seeking to play a critical role including high office, and a future permanent government. These are not just any elections. They will provide Libyans with an opportunity to have their say in their representation, including the first elected president of Libya. And elections, of course, are just the beginning of the journey to set Libya on a path to deal with real issues of governance and sovereignties, issues like um, the presence of mercenaries in the country, foreign meddling, institutional disunity, minority inclusion, transitional justice, and other, and other questions that need to be decided by a representative government. In the spirit of fostering dialogue, the leaders we host will have several minutes to give opening remarks, after which I will ask them questions in order to explicate their positions and their views. I will try to ask the same questions of all speakers in this discussion series so people here can hear and compare their unique responses. After I finish asking questions, I will then turn to the audience members for their questions. To the audience here at, in person at USIP headquarters, welcome. And I encourage you to please raise your hands to pose questions to Mr. Lamine when we get to that portion of the program. To those watching online, you can send questions through Twitter at hashtag Libya Elections USIP. We will try to get to as many questions as possible. Now I am pleased to introduce Mr. Fada Lamine. Mr. Lamine is the founder and lead member of the Afak Awatan. Uh, this is a new political party with an agenda aimed at building the Libyan democratic straight state through empowerment of youth and women as a critical element of, peace, of a peaceful and prosper, prosperous Libya. He is, he is the former Director General of the National Election and Social Development Board, which is an official institution of the Libyan Prime Minister. Prime Ministry. He now serves as Senior Technical Advisor to the Board. He was also a coordinator of the independent group of the UN-led al Ashkarat Libyan Political Dialogue and the, and the architects of the Libyan Political Agreement that currently, that the current government of Libya trans, that have allowed for the transition under UN Security Council resolutions. Mr. Lamine led a diverse Libyan team to develop the groundbreaking project, Libya, Peace and Prosperity, a 15-year integrated economic plan to develop the country. He chairs the National Dialogue Preparatory Commission in Libya 
to foster inter-Libya dialogue. He worked as a member of a, of a team assigned by the Prime Minister to review and implement government economic policy. And previously, Mr. Lamine, Mr. Lamine worked in Washington, D.C. in various capacities, including as a non-resident fellow of the Atlantic Council, sharing his expertise on democratic transitions, countering violent extremism, and regional economic integration. And with that, let me turn the floor over to Mr. Lamine, and we look forward to your opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, much appreciated. Thank you to the USIP. Thank you uh, uh, for uh, the invite and, and for uh, making this platform available for us to, uh, to interact uh, uh, regarding Libya and also to uh, highlight uh, how important the situation in Libya is not to just to the Libyans but also to the uh, to the international community. I think uh, we are looking at Libya right now from a very different uh, perspective. Uh, it's not Libya, the oil uh, rich country, which is not that rich anyway, <laughs> as many people think it is. Uh, but Libya is very important from the geopolitical point of view for, to the region and to the uh, uh, globally as we see shifts in, in the international uh, global world order as, as we may call it. Uh, so uh, Libya is a very important uh, piece of this, uh, this puzzle that uh, we have to make sure that it's uh, stable, secure, and uh, prosperous in order to help its own people, our people, and but also to uh, to be able to be a center for stability for the for the region and at the global level, so uh, I do thank you for for making this uh, forum available. I think it's uh, it's a great opportunity for uh, for us uh, to think across uh, border lines uh, about uh, what we share and the concerns. Uh, elections, uh, as everybody talks about elections, elections are usually tools, means to to uh, not to change government, uh, but to enable people to participate publicly in, in, the, in the affairs of, uh, of their own country and decide their leaders. But sometimes uh, they become uh, a transitional goal uh, uh, in themselves. Once uh, you tried so many difficult uh, ways in order to bring uh, uh, legitimacy and stability, uh, uh, but you fail. Uh, uh, then you have to to make the transition um, not through dialogue, but only, but to 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 move forward to give the general public uh, an ability to uh, to determine their destiny and the way forward. And I think. Uh, in normal circumstances, elections and, and transitions, they don't usually jive well because elections, usually there is a, a winner and a loser and post-conflict uh, has, you know, you want to try to find uh, 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 some kind of uh, a common ground. Uh, but sometimes, uh, as in the case of Libya, uh, since 2011, we have seen that we have went through processes of the uh, uh, first uh, TNC, the Transitional Council, when it appoints two um, prime ministers, executive bodies, uh, in 2011 and 2012, early, uh, late 2011, uh, early 2012, then that led to an election. That election provided uh, uh, a legislative body a hyper body legislative and and and, uh, and more of uh, executive in a sense it has uh, mixed powers uh, also that also resulted in in some kind of uh, of a government that came out of of that uh, that body the uh, GNC at that time 
And that GNC, you know, provided the two, pri two prime ministers, one in 2012, one in 2013, the end of 2013, early 2014, when the first uh, prime minister uh, uh, after the election was, uh, was sacked. Uh, that led to a war. Uh, then the international community came and, and, uh, and we engaged in, in the Asherat Agreement uh, to stop the, the, the conflict, the civil war, and uh, the UN process appointed through dialogue, uh, a prime minister, Mr. Saraj, came to be. Uh, the, the dialogue was supposed to create a, a government of national accord. Uh, but once the Libyans sign uh, that agreement, uh, they end up not abiding by it. So the agreement uh, fell in implementation. That failure led to continuous division. So it became a government, but it's not of a national accord. It's not of a national, it's not of a court. The division with two, uh, two government continued to be. And what I'm trying to say, why are we here for election. Uh, uh, that, after a while, uh, the conflict continued, led to several skirmishes here and there, led to the 2019 uh, invasion of, uh, of uh, Tripoli uh, with the presence of, of foreign troops, uh, mercenaries. The conflict got worse from Libyan, uh, Libyan uh, conflict to an internationalized conflict with the Russians, the mercenaries, the Turks, the mercenaries uh, from different countries. Uh, that was devastating uh, conflict uh, that also led nowhere but uh, uh, devastation and loss of lives. The United Nations also stepped in to create uh, a process uh, that's called the Geneva process. This Geneva process was supposed to develop a roadmap. It developed a roadmap. Part of the roadmap is to come with a government of national unity. Uh, one of its tasks to, to, uh, to lead to an election uh, to create the needed legitimacy as all the bodies in Libya that are right now in conflict, none of them has any kind of uh, real legitimacy. They are all expired bodies in, in terms of the one that were elected at one time or another. Others, uh, they created their own presence through sheer force or, or via uh, uh, other influential processes within the region, be it regional or tribal. Uh, uh. The conflict, uh, the armed conflict stops. GNC, uh, GNU was developed. It is struggling uh, to become a government of national unity. So that national didn't work, the unity did not work, and, and that speaks to the importance of the roadmap that we have right now, which is a process that's supposed to lead to a national election. In this case, it was important for us to have a government that is elected by the Libyan people. That's the only option that was left. After all options, national options, UN processes options, all of these things fail in many, in many ways. There was a lot of international interference as well, regional and international interference that also had its, uh, its impact and casted its shadows uh, on the Libyan uh, uh, situation. Um, in this case, uh, in my view, what we have, I've been for a while uh, advocating is what I called a reset. We need a total reset of the scene. There are so many bodies are sitting there. Um, none wants to leave, except the other leave at the same time. So either they all leave or they all stay. So it's a all or nothing. And who would be the best judge to decide on this except the Libyan people. I think uh, we have tried in the last 10 years so many different ways of finding a way out of this conflict, finding uh, 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 you know, a light at the end of the tunnel, processes by Libyan, 
themselves, processes by Libyan institutions, and, and also processes through the United Nations mediation. Unfortunately, uh, uh, those processes did not succeed. Uh, uh, I think uh, the only processes we have not tried yet is to have the Libyan people decide directly one man, one vote, uh, or one woman, one vote, one person, one vote, one citizen, one vote, for them to decide their own future. Uh, we should not be fearful of, of the Libyan choice. Uh, we should not undermine it. We should give it a chance because I think uh, it will create the needed legitimacy uh, that will carry us. Um, the election is not, a, is not a goal in itself at the end of the day. We still need to uh, evolve and, and go through the transition in order to have a constitution, in order to have a, a reconciliation and all the process to build the state. But election is, is, is a very important stop, uh, you know, uh, for, uh, for us to create the legitimacy that is needed uh, in order for the Libyans to recognize uh, and decide who their leaders are, but at the same time for the international community uh, to, uh, to understand that there is an elected legitimate li Libyan leadership that they can deal with. and. Uh, that will lead eventually with the power that was installed uh, uh, to this elected uh, uh, executive body and legislative body uh, for them to call for the uh, secession of the uh, international intervention uh, at the same time for, uh, for the mercenaries and other uh, uh, forces uh, to, uh, to leave, uh, leave the country and to create the needed uh, process to move forward. Uh, Libyans, um, we've been suffering through uh, uh, three difficult things. Uh, number one, uh, there is a continuous state of fear among the stakeholders in Libya. That fear has generated some, some of this fear is, is genuine, some of this fear is imaginary, but nonetheless, it's a, there is a, an atmosphere of fear who will take what, who will do what to the other, uh, who will take revenge, who will try to cast away uh, the other uh, uh, forces, the lack of, of, uh, of comfort. The other thing is, is, is a lack of confidence. Uh, there is no confidence uh, among the Libyan. That fear will lead to the absence of confidence, and we have to work on that. And I remember the Eskherat Agreement and the and the preamble of the agreement uh, measures of building confidence measures were stated very well. Unfortunately, were never implemented. The third thing is lack of the common uh, platform. Since these two are the, the driving forces uh, uh, in, in the interaction uh, in Libya, uh, it, it created, uh, uh, it never gave the opportunity for the for the stakeholders to think about what, what's, what's common, what do they uh, have in common, so building in, in, in bridges and, and, and common ground that will lead to, uh, to think. In that sense, those who are fearful or opposing to election because of, of the fear of the future, they would love to have the status quo as long as possible because they fear, uh, feel that they have some presence, some influence. As long as change come, uh, they don't have any guarantees. They don't see themselves in the future as they should. Because of the two, uh, first thing, fear and lack of confidence, that led to lack of common platform that can lead them together to the future. That feeling of exclusionary feeling that continues to, to evolve, that also led to each party, each stakeholder is seeking help and support from an international uh, uh, or, or foreign uh, forces or, or entities and became uh, clientele processes where, um, where everybody is somehow hooked to uh, uh, regional or, or international 
uh, you know, interests at the same time. Uh, and that complicated the, the situation. Libya is, 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 is very important, and I think uh, even the international players all over uh, uh, the world, I think Libya is essential. The geographical location, the Mediterranean issues, being in North Africa, being part of the Middle East somehow, being the gateway to Africa, these are very important elements. And, uh, and the international, uh, you know, uh, the countries that are uh, uh, engaged in Libya, I would love them to have uh, a, an economic competition rather than uh, having Libya as as a battleground. Uh, I think we will we'll be welcoming them, you know, bringing their investment, bringing their expertise, partnering with, uh, with the Libyan people. Libya can uh, uh, include all these uh, opportunities. So um, I, would, I would call uh, for those who are afraid of the election not to be fearful of the will of the Libyan people. I think uh, uh, we should have that kind of uh, trust and respect that they will make the right decision. But at the same time, we want to make sure that everybody gets a chance to be engaged in this process. I'm totally against uh, preconditions that will exclude uh, uh, people from the process. We need as much uh, uh, wider ownership of the election process. We need to get everybody get a fair chance at sh a shot at this process and let the Libyan people through election be the judge. Uh, preconditions will lead to narrowing the, the field and deciding on the behalf of the people who should be and who should not. And this is somehow, um, uh, it's undermining uh, the rights uh, of the Libyan people to decide who they want. Let's have a process, let's have a clean process as much as possible. It's not going to be the, the, the best and the cleanest, the ideal, but, uh, uh, you know, sh we should not let, uh, you know, uh, perfect be the enemy of the, uh, of the good. Thank you. Great. Great. Thank you for those very rich opening remarks. There's a lot to build on, and a number of questions come to my mind right away, but... Um, but let, let's talk, let's stick with elections for the moment. And um, uh, since you raised some several uh, issues there, including that there are some who are fearful of elections, to have a stake in the current status quo. But so what is your overall assessment, whether or not elections will actually happen on time, scheduled for next month, uh, for the presidential elections, and then parliamentary elections to happen soon thereafter. So how do you see it? Do you think it's definitely going to happen? I think it's, uh, it's, we are beyond the point of if it's going to happen or not. The question is how, in terms of timeline, uh, in terms of the processes themselves. Um, people who oppose the elections spend so much time and effort. Some of them are genuine concerns. Some of them are hyped uh, excuses, uh, uh, mainly. Uh, I would love to have seen those who have serious concerns address these concerns, have a conversation, and try to mitigate these concerns and fears instead of uh, of making them as big as possible, hype them to the level to the point, then come to the to the to the point to said, therefore there should be no election. This is not the way things work. We, 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 we have problems, we solve problems. We have concerns, we deal with concerns. We have issues, we work through our issues. And I think that's the way it should be. And I think the sooner they realize that is the only thing that can unite the Libyan people or any people in the, is when they look to the future, not look to the, their current divisions. The future can unite people. You cannot change the past. You can work through the present to develop a better future. So it will happen. Uh, we have to work through the process. Uh, the United Nations uh, uh, should have been more engaged in Libya in terms of uh, the, uh, the mission in Libya uh, in mediating, mitigating this, these uh, issues and difficulty. They have done some, and I think they could have done more. Uh, but also it falls uh, to the uh, shoulders of the, of the Libyan people to, to work uh, with themselves and being positive in, in, in working through the process. At the end of the day, we want to save a country that is 
continuing to, to, to suffer greatly for the last 10 years. Great, thanks. So my understanding is that the registration process for the election is still being finalized. But that said, let me be forthright and ask you, if it does become finalized, are you, will you be running for president of the country? Will you want to be the first elected president of Libya? Well, I'm, uh, to me, uh, um, the goal is, is not who should be in power. The, the goal is to make sure that ultimately we get where we need to be. Uh, so getting the Libyans to cast their votes, to, to make choices, to have as many choices as, as possible, uh, not to narrow their, their field to the point that becomes, uh, to create apathy toward election. And I think that we can do that very easily. Because this guy's not, this guy's this, uh, no, not this, no this. So who do you want? Oh, choose me. It doesn't work though. Or choose nobody, let's stay. I mean, I, I heard one gentleman at one time said, uh, the best uh, system for Libya is a fragmented system. I don't know what a fragmented system means. <laughs> if you need a state or you don't need a state. Fragmented system where everybody have a little bit of influence and power fragmentally and there is no state. Uh, it doesn't work this way. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about it. I'm, I'm looking at it uh, uh, as this possibility and I think uh, um, it's not w to get to power and what are you going to do with it? once you get there. And I think there are a lot of things that we, we need to, uh, to consider. Uh, uh, the first day in office, uh, would you just say, hey, what are we going to do next? Or do you have a plan? Uh, there are too many things. We have to work on the reconciliation process. We have to uh, put the house in order. We have to look at the economic situation. We have to look at the dire uh, economic uh, 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 status in Libya. It's not as, as good as so many people think. We have to think about these mercenaries. We have to think about our relations with Saudi, so too many countries, and then, uh, you know, sort these things out. We have to bring the basic services and make the stable economic, social. Uh, we have to think about the education that is collapsing. We have to think about health care, and health uh, system is, is, is undermined. Uh, the basic services also. Uh, it's not about just pumping money into people's hands. And I think it's uh, because that can raise uh, inflation and devalue the, the, the Libyan currency. So uh, anybody who can tackle and think and has a good team that tackle uh, should be should consider it. Uh, I'm, I'm still considering. And uh, if somebody can do it better than me, I'll, I'll vote for them. <laughs> Well, let's, let's, let's go down this line, though. Let's say that you do run and you do become elected. You would be the first president of, uh, elected president of Libya, which carries a lot of importance to that and a lot of significance. Uh, could you just give us some sense of your kind of philosophy of leadership um, and, and vision that comes with that? How would you lead? I think uh, anybody who takes over in, in this kind of circumstances, they have to, f they have to have a deep understanding of the of the status of of the Libyan uh, situation, uh, not just the economic side, not just the political fragmentation, not just the the uh, the presence of so many uh, foreign forces in Libya. Libya has become a point of uh, place of conflict. Um, they have to understand the. The, the level of importance and complexity of the geopolitical place in Libya. The, you have six neighbors. Uh, you, you try to uh, calm three, three others will be unhappy. You get to five, the sixth one will be. By the time you get to the sixth year, the, the, the first one will be uh, uh, having issues. Uh, um, so uh, it's not easy. And, and the, the goal is to build a state. Uh, not, not a regime, not a system only. Building a state means uh, inspiring uh, the people, creating citizenship, uh, providing the basic services, making sure that people have, have the level of, 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 of you know, um, good living, which is uh, they have to have a good economic system, good uh, health system, good educational system, good services, so they become 
at least uh, capable of participating in a, a, at a higher level. If you think of your basic needs all the time, which is how, that's how Libya was for the last uh, 50 years, I think people become very apath apathetic into a process uh, and they became dependent on them. You need a, a smaller st uh, government, you don't need a big government. You have to empower uh, younger people and women and, and, and to, to uh, become pioneers in uh, not in the work of government, but to in the all uh, areas of life, economic uh, development. Uh, they have to have the chances uh, to, to build their own careers. Uh, uh, the government should be a supporting factor, not an employer. Uh, having almost uh, over two million people working for the government in Libya is, is, is crazy. And, and people do that because they don't have an opportunity to work anywhere else. Uh, and government, unfortunately, uh, all these government, they create uh, uh, companies, so government-owned companies, uh, and institutions that they own. Uh, so the, instead of providing the assistance for the private citizens, so the conglomerates to work on, on their own and develop the economic side by themselves. So, uh, government-owned companies, it's, it's, it's ridiculous uh, in me because, to me, uh, I think in a sense that uh, what you do is, is you create that continuous state of dependency on the state. So, and that will m make it difficult for the citizens to, to, to be able to uh, uh, have an oversight or the government to be accountable to the state. What makes people accountable and uh, the government accountable to, to the people is when people pay taxes and, and the government becomes an employee of the, Lib of the Libyan people, not the other way around. So that kind of uh, dynamics need to change. We have to create uh, a common uh, a sense of purpose, a uh, common platform. Uh, we have to evolve uh, slowly but maturely uh, as, a, as a Libyan people. Uh, everybody should be involved. We have to carry everybody. Carrying few and leaving the others, the others will make sure that you are not going to go anywhere. So it's, it's, a, it's a monumental task, honestly. Uh, and it has to be done by bringing people together. You have to have them. You might disagree with them, but you have to have them at the table. Exclusionary processes will never work. Great. Um, if I could continue along this theme, you talk about um, fragmentation as a concern and unity of process you just talked about. I was wondering if you could talk about this issue of um, how, do you, how do, you, do you as a leader bring unity? What are the symbols that you would want to uh, bring forth uh, to, to create this greater unity? How would you deal with um, tribes which have been felt marginalized, uh, uh, particularly in the South? How do you bring unity from East and West? Um, how do you also deal with the issue of a, a government which has tended to be centralized in Tripoli and yet allow for power to be uh, decentralized into the into provinces, so a lot of different balancing acts, and so this issue of how basically do you uh, unify the Libyan people? Well, I, I, you know what, I, I I always think of Libya uh, when when you see it from the outside, and and uh, you you have uh, <laughs> we have a doctor here, uh, we have uh, so many superficial wounds. They are not deep, but they are many. So they bleed. The body is bleeding all over the place, but this, this uh, bleeding is not, is not, not very deep. Uh, but when somebody has, uh, you know, keeps scratching himself or herself uh, harshly, uh, I think um, you have to treat that. Uh, there are so many issues, but at the same time, those issues are not uh, very deep-rooted issues. I am from uh, half from the east, half from the west. Uh, I was born in Benghazi. I live in Tripoli. My father from the west. My mom from the east. Uh, to me, there's no east and west. You know, 
uh, others who don't understand that uh, when when there is there may be some regional uh, you know difference in terms of, of traditions and cultures and and and, and uh, and the way that people think about things, and that's enriching. That shouldn't be something that we have to dwell on in a negative way. Uh, I think uh, the failure in creating a Libyan identity for the last 50 years, I think that was something that it has to be addressed. Uh, what unites Libya? They are Libyans. Uh, and, and, and that sense, for a long time, we, have, we had a, a regime, not a state, in a sense that uh, the regime is identified with, with the people, with, with individuals. The uh, uh, Libyan system evolved from a uh, uh, federalized system under the king to uh, uh, a central system afterwards to uh, uh, a system that I don't know how to prescribe it, but a, a regime controls the state. Uh, uh, the absence of this created so much fragmentation, and bringing those people together, you have to you have to unite them about citizenship to a state, to a country that they 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 belong to, and they they want to build, and they see a future for themselves and their kids and their grandkids. Uh, we want a stable and unified Libya for the next for the next. Uh, hundreds of years, not for every five, 50 years or 100 years we have to, you know, uh, rebuild again or, 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 or uh, find ways to deconstruct and, and rebuild each time. That's not how you build countries. That's, how, that's not how we build society. Uh, so there are many things. What should be the, the system? Um, that people should enjoy living with, um, that we should we should consider it. Uh, we should consider the federal system. There is nothing wrong with the federal system. Probably a federal system in Libya uh, will not be a, a, a three typical uh, uh, regions as historical as it used to be, because each region has its own configuration within itself. The Tripolitanian region, it has a four or five regions. The, the eastern region has at least four regions within itself. Uh, the south, the same. Unfortunately, the south has been neglected continuously for a long time. Most of the people in the south moved to Tripoli. Now Tripoli uh, is a, a city, the capital, should host no more than a million, million and a half. Now it has almost three million people uh, because lack of service, lack of security in the, in the south. Uh, the South is, 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 is a very, very important uh, region. Uh, we have to stabilize uh, uh, the presence uh, of Libyans, of citizens in the South. We have to provide opportunity uh, because that's how you, you, you create. There are so many opportunities that you can, we can develop in the southern part of Libya. Uh, it, there has to be an investment. There has always been promises of investment of billion of dinars and, and so on, but never uh, developed, uh, never came to fruition. Uh, promises don't solve problems. Actions do. And I think uh, um, Libya needs, needs, needs more people, and, 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 and it has to accommodate uh, uh, working uh, people from other countries. We have to think about how this can be brought. We need, we need help. In that sense, and and this has to be done through a, a legal system and, and a system that will provide us the opportunity to to take the best brains and, and take uh, the best possible uh, help that we can get. Uh, we have to make sure that we have a clear arrangement and agreement for our security uh, with the neighbors, especially in the south. Uh, the threat of, of terrorism, the threat of uh, illegal immigration, in terms of uh, uh, human trafficking is 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 very big issue. It's a it's a shameful uh, uh, thing that we have uh, in Libya right now, and it should be addressed very seriously. You you touched on a number of points and questions uh, in answering questions that I wanted to ask, but um, I'm very keen in 
making sure we're, we're keeping with time here. But let me just finish with this issue of uh, unity. And you raise this issue of the past and the history uh, of Libya. Um, and so it raises the question of transitional justice, this notion of how do you deal with what has occurred in the past without relitigating it. And there are those who basically say there should be a general amnesty for those who committed human right violations. And then there are those who say, no, there should be some type of process where victims can uh, uh, address their abusers. How do you view this issue of dealing with the past and transitional justice? Well, I think it's very, it's very important. It's very, it's very delicate at the same time. I think you are between one to administer justice as much as, as you can and, and also in terms of uh, building a state. A state cannot be built via uh, revenge and vengeance, no matter what happened. I've been, you know, uh, I opposed Gaddafi for, uh, for years and years, uh, and uh, I wasn't uh, happy at all. I deplore the way he was, he was, he, uh, his life was ended. Uh, and, and I think we have to uh, be cognizant if we are calling for a better uh, uh, behavior, we should be the first to, to apply that. Uh, there is a difference between uh, um, uh, addressing uh, issues related to transitional justice uh, and at the same time being very cognizant of the importance at the end of the day of the greater goal of building a state. Um, that's why um, tools like the isolation law that was uh, uh, implemented in 2012, that was a very bad idea and I think we've seen the impact of that in an, in Syria and in Iraq, uh, uh, the, you have to balance between making sure that what happened never happened again and making sure that you don't become subject, uh, you, you don't become a hostage to, the, to, to these processes that will blind you to the point that you don't see what you're trying to, you, to, to build in the future because otherwise you become so uh, entrenched and so uh, much in the chains of, of, of the moment, of the present, or the past, which is worse even than the present. Uh, balancing these things uh, are, are very important. Uh, the responsibility of statesmen is to build the state. Uh, responsibility of the institutions is to provide justice to the individuals. At the same time, uh, you know, um, there are ways of reconciliation that should be, should be used, and we are not going to reinvent the wheel. At the same time, if individuals feel that they can uh, address their concerns and their, uh, their grievances through, uh, through the legal system, uh, they should have the right to do so. Uh, uh, number one, for, for those who uh, have uh, committed these acts, uh, they have to understand that they are, uh, uh, they are responsible. But at the same time, uh, more important at the level of the state level uh, and the future level is, is to make sure that uh, whoever thinks about something like this in the future, they will understand that there will be consequences for those. It's a pre preventative measure that we have to think about. Um, uh, we encourage people to uh, to forgive and forget uh, for the benefit of their uh, of their uh, children and grandchildren because as I said vindictiveness is not going to help anybody uh, we encourage the state at the same time to provide some measure that mitigates some of the of these issues so they can be funds for that uh, for for these kind of, uh, of 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 things but at the same time uh, we have to have a legal system that is functioning, that can look at these things and, and provide. We don't have it. So we, we cannot put the, uh, the, the car, uh, carriage in front of the horse, as I say. We have to make sure that the, uh, we have our, uh, our priority set in, in, in order, which is to build a state, to have a legal system, to have a, a, a system that can provide justice at the same time. So people sometimes they have to be a little bit patient. 
It's nothing as instantaneous as we think. Uh, who sets the priority? What should be? Now justice or now reconciliation? These are very important questions. Now building a state or now just uh, carrying a war so whoever is going to win first? Um, uh, these are the, the setting this kind of tones and priority is the, the one of the responsibility of, of the leadership. And, and you have to convince people of that. Being mindful of the time here, um, I have a whole bunch of other questions, but I want to open the question to the people in the audience first. I'll take one question from the people here, and then I'll kind of ask a question from people who have asked questions online. So please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lamine, for your excellent insights, and thanks for USIP. Uh, quick question. While we all agree that the elections is the best thing coming up in Libya uh, to get Libya uh, moving forward, um, I am quite concerned about the imperfections or the challenges that are ahead. And I'm, I wanted to get your perspective on how are we going to manage some of those, at least in a, in a broader picture, uh, we are dealing with a constitutional basis that has yet to be finally defined. Uh, it does impact, you know, how the system of governors may be, especially that we're conducting both a presidential and a parliamentarian election. Uh, do we have some uh, framework that we think is going to be able to deliver that? We have the concern of uh, the threat and security of participation and ensuring that these are transparent elections. Uh, do we have a good sense of... Uh, are we going to be able to manage that, especially in light of the fact that this is only a few weeks ago uh, from now? Um, and then generally, we, we, we have uh, potential breakouts from an imperfect election. So even though we want to make it happen, we don't want it to become the recipe for potential division or potential war in the future. How do we grapple with all these? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think it's... Uh, <laughs> These are the questions, these are the issues that we, we should have a conversation about. Uh, instead of uh, targeting the whole idea of election and make sure that will never happen. Because if you kill the idea, you don't have to deal with the, with the difficulties that, <laughs> that comes with it. So people, <laughs> usually they go for the easy thing. Kill the damn thing, so get rid of it. And, and because we do have, we don't, so we can go home and, 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 and watch TV or play cards. Um, of course, that's not the case. Uh, these are issues. These are serious issues. And, and as far as the, uh, um, the constitutional base, I think there are constitutional base. I, I disagree with people who keep talking about it, not defining it. What is the constitutional base? It's an election law. We have elections before, so we are not starting from scratch. This is uh, this election law that we have in 2012, we have to uh, amend it a little bit in 2014. Can it carry us, it carried us, uh, us out in, in a couple of times and get us some result for all these people who, uh, an institution that they believe that they are legitimate and they continue to cling of legitimacy after they expired? Well, we can, we can, we can use this. Can we amend it? Uh, there was, uh, there has been a, a, a pathway by the HOR and the State Council to come together and do that. They have been coming together and failing to do that. I question their sincerity uh, most of the time in getting serious about uh, uh, going away, being resetted. Um, that's a, uh, it, it, there is a conflict of interest inherited in this process. Uh, so I think we do have enough uh, to start with. Um, uh, the election, the election law that was passed by the HOR, uh, it's it's a good start. Uh, I'm not saying it's perfect. Probably, they need to vote in it uh, to make sure that it's it's voted on and 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 and, and make sure that it it will be, you know, uh, protected from many uh, litigation, legal litigation, uh, as many as possible. It doesn't mean that there will no be be no legal litigations. Uh, it should be, and, and it's okay. It should be addressed at, at that level. Um, it's not going to be a perfect election. I have never seen uh, uh, a perfect election. I think people in the United States have seen election in 
uh, Bush uh, versus Al Gore <laughs> before. We've seen the one recently. Um, uh, of course, there is a def we have a, there is an election in, in in Iraq. That's not a perfect election. There are militias there. There are so many. Hashd al-Shabi and others. Who, I mean, they came uh, from war. There is Iran. There is all these guys. But there is an election. Election is it. It brings you closer. It sets you one step further into a process of stabilization. So we have to see it this way. It's not the the ultimate goal. Whoever sits in will will never. Let's make sure people who complain about there is no constitution in Libya. We have seen a constitution that is molded by, um, in, in such a way, probably be trapped so much in Tunisia. We've seen the uh, 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 civil, uh, you know, um, servant who became president uh, took over the whole process and suspended the constitution. So there is no full guarantee of anything. I think uh, we have to work through the, the difficulty. We have to have uh, conversation, negotiation, dialogue, name it what you want to name it. But we have to bring all the people, as I said, who have concerns to discuss these concerns, uh, to have them invest in this process, uh, to see that they can be part of, of the future of this process. To, to make sure that they feel they will not be targeted by the outcome of this process. These are things that are not going to be uh, 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 guaranteed via a uh, 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 constitutional uh, process or, 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 or just a law. I think these are human interactions that have to take place. Um, I think we have enough to do it. Difficulties, yes. Impossible, no. We have also to think about what if, what if election doesn't happen. I think I can guarantee you division, war, and all the other uh, element of, of, of a bad agenda, a bad outcome. So sometimes you take uh, the, uh, the the whatever is, is least uh, it has least worst consequences. Uh, if I can say that, thank you. Um, so I want to turn to some of the, to an online question that we received. We received a number of questions just for your uh, knowledge and to acknowledge that uh, about the election itself. The questions range from what happens if someone doesn't accept the outcome of the election, you know, to what happens if Saif Gaddafi wins the election, if Haftar wins, wins the election. Uh, well, you know, asking all sorts of questions about what, how do you see the consequences of all that. But I'm going to, uh, I think you answered some of these questions just now, but so I want to turn to another set of questions we got, which concerns more foreign affairs. Um, and these range from the questions of how do you expedite the withdrawal of foreign fighters? Um, what is the plan to address uh, Russians expanding presence in Libya uh, and Russia look, uh, role as a kingmaker? Um, you know, how does foreign mercenaries complicate the peace process in Libya? What are the plans, again, for the removal? Uh, what is needed from the United States to support Libya's stabilization and strengthening Libya? What can, be, what can the Europeans do? Uh, what can Libya's immediate neighbors do? So there's a bunch of questions here really about foreign affairs. So if you could try to address all those <laughs> in one swoop, that'd be great. Thank you. Sure. Uh, uh. Thanks. Uh, I think uh, uh, let's start with the uh, with who can have the credibility to call for the withdrawal of these mercenaries and foreign uh, troops in Libya. Of course, there is a mix of foreign <laughs> troops and, and mercenaries in Libya. I, I believe and, and I think uh, uh, only a, a legitimate uh, uh, directly elected president can do that, has the legitimacy, uh, because he has the voice of the Libyan people. Uh, everybody else, we've seen right now, uh, as, as the different stakeholders, everybody, each one has a stake in one side or another. One side has uh, a close relationship with the, uh, with the Russians and, and, and the other mercenary. The other side has a close relationship with the Turks and the other side. Uh, Russia claims that she, uh, they came in via the HOR's uh, uh, mandate. Uh, 
the, the Turks come, came through the GNU, GNA uh, request. So each one has a claim, and we, we cannot, we can argue this forever, and, and it will not work. Uh, and everybody uh, wants to stay. In the absence of breakthrough, uh, I think the status quo will continue and to, to, to continue to get worse, not better. Uh, uh, and, and in that sense, elections are very, very important uh, to, in order to address the whole issue of uh, foreign uh, presence in Libya. Uh, uh, and I think it has a voice. It will be a process. It's not going to be overnight. Uh, there would have to be a negotiation. Of course, those forces are not going to withdraw because you ask them to withdraw. Uh, you have to provide uh, a lot of, uh, uh, I don't want to call it incentives, but things <laughs> to that extent, uh, the carrot and the stick at the same time, uh, probably Libyan people. Uh, uh, if things get worse, I think we probably will 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 defend their own homeland if they need to. Uh, there is no doubt about it. But uh, uh, we don't want it to get to that point. I think there will be a lot of uh, uh, ways and opportunities for the for the elected uh, leadership to to negotiate and 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 do have offer. We need we need cooperation from all sides. Uh, Libya can offer an opportunity to, to all sides to, to participate and become uh, a partner instead of, uh, of uh, 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 an adversary. Um, in terms of the internationals, I think uh, um, I, I, I like and appreciate the fact that the United, Nation, United States has been consistent uh, in, uh, in its message uh, regarding the election. I think they have uh, seen uh, the, 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 the outcome of the processes in the last uh, 10 years or so. Uh, and the issue of, of Libyan stability is, is, is very, very, very important, uh, not just to Libya, but to the region. We've seen uh, the impact when Libya got into, engulfed into a conflict and, and chaos, uh, arms, uh, from Libya uh, reached so many different countries you cannot imagine, you know, in years, uh, and, and, and very far away in, in the last few years. Um, so the consistent message is a stable Libya, uh, and we have to give the people uh, a chance to, to decide for their own leadership, and we need an elected leader that can, uh, uh, you know, uh, lead the country uh, and lead the process uh, towards stability, somebody that uh, the world can deal with, uh, who has the, uh, the voice of the, of the Libyan people. And it's, it's, uh, I think it's very important. For the other countries, I think uh, there are interests uh, in, in Libya. Uh, Libya is a neighbor, Libya is an influencer, Libya is influenced. Um, these should, be, should not fear from an, an elected process. Uh, uh, dealing with a legitimate uh, elected leader is much better than le dealing with a bunch of, uh, of self-interested uh, groups uh, who are somehow uh, hooked to uh, other foreign actors in, in one way or another. They, sometimes they talk on their own behalf, sometimes they talk on behalf of somebody else. Um, this fragmentation is not uh, effective uh, and it doesn't it's not helpful for the neighbors. It's not helpful for our, for for Africa. It's not helpful for the Mediterranean. Uh, as we see, uh, opportunity. Uh, I think we can we can do better uh, with with partnership instead of uh, of conflicting interest uh, uh, in Libya. Great. Well, thank you. Um, that hour went by really quickly, I have to admit, and we didn't get a chance to come to all of the questions I would have liked to ask, and I'm sure from our members of our audience as well, I hope that you can talk with them as we come to the end of this program. And I'm sure there are more questions from people who are watching and sending them online, but we are at the end of this hour, and I want to thank you so much for this uh, opportunity to hear your views. Uh, you were very comprehensive in addressing a whole bunch of issues as well. So uh, you answered, I think, a lot of questions along the way, too. So on behalf of USIP, again, thank you so much. 
Um, and uh, thank you to Robert Barron, to Nate Wilson, to Ezra, who helped put this together, to our interpreter, Nabil. Um, these were all very useful. And I, as I have mentioned, this is a series of discussions that we're having with Libyan leaders, so I hope people will tune in for the next time we come together with a, another leader. And again, thank you. We wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it, and I enjoyed it, and thanks for uh, for your uh, uh, for hosting it, and, and thanks for the audience who came and participated, and for all those who addressed the questions. I'm sorry if I couldn't get the chance to address the other question. I hope my answers to the, uh, to some questions um, dealt with some of their concerns. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.